Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, this is all joint with Stephen Civic, who's luckily enough here, because I'm guaranteed to say something stupid, both because it's recording and because I always say something stupid. So hopefully Stephen will save, save us in that case. Um, yes, so um, I want to look at the, f the, the following picture, where we've got a three manifold and some contact structure. And we want to understand the ways in which this can be realized. This is the boundary of some, some symplectic four manifold with some additional constraints on it. So usually the constraints that we put on this are um, a weak boundary compatibility, which says that um, this symplectic form, when I restrict it to the contact planes, is positive. Um, we can ask for a strong compatibility, which says that if I look at omega near y, it looks like um, uh, d of, well, usually we write this e to the t alpha, but it's some sort of um, sort of locally exact in your alpha that e to the t is somehow expanding, but um, this is, oh sorry, that's weak. This is uh, strong. Um, and then a, f uh, uh, a strengthening of that even is Stein, where we say that, that, that there's a sort of compatible J which, which makes this thing complex, um, sort of analytically complex manifold. Um, in between here, and I'm going to sort of mention this just because it's it's true. Um, if you're Stein, then in particular your symplectic form is exact everywhere, and so you could you could actually ask for something in between these two situations where your symplectic form itself is exact on the nose as a form. And so these are the kinds of things that that we, we want to sort of understand. Given a given a contact three manifold, um, do there exist symplectic fillings of these types? And if so, what can you say about them? Um, yes. So let's get the notes in the right order here. And yeah, I've I've sort of like only sort of tested this talk before, so it may be that this is done in thirty minutes, and maybe it's gonna like I'll get halfway through. So if you have questions, please ask, and I will try to make this reasonably coherent. But uh, we'll see. Okay, so the 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 example that I really want to focus on is uh, when y is the the unit cotangent bundle of a surface. Um, Because this is somehow the prototypical example of, 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 a, of a contact manifold. This is admits a, a contact structure coming as the boundary of um, a sort of, I want to consider these arrows boundary arrows. So this is the boundary of some uh, four manifold. And it's the unit disk cotangent bundle of the surface, which is the, uh, the prototypical symplectic manifold. Like, this is why we have symplectic manifolds, is because of the cotangent bundle. Uh, because of the phase space here. Um, so this thing is sort of naturally symplectic. In fact, it's exact. Um, it's, even, it's even Stein. Uh, the boundary is naturally this, this contact uh, manifold. And somehow these are the, these are the first contact manifolds that, that, that you know, God or physics grants us when we, when we start looking at, at, at manifolds. Um, all right, so this is the thing that I want to understand. This is the example that we want to we focus on. OK. So all right, what's the range of, of, of kinds of answers that we have for this question in general? Um, all right, well, so first, you know, what's, the, what's the obvious contact structure? If you think about S3 is the boundary of the four ball. So S3 has a standard contact structure on it. Um, this object has a unique filling. Um, so it's, it's unique in, in lots of ways. So there's a unique um, minimal, um, and you can even say weak, filling. And it's just the four ball, which we think about as the, uh, bottom, as the product symplectic structure. And this is Elie Oshberg. And this goes back to <coughs> 91, one of the first uses of the Holmwerfer curves, relative Holmwerfer curves for contact manifolds. Um, you can generalize this to uh, lens spaces with, um, again, something called the standard contact structure. So all of the, the lens spaces have one contact structure that comes from 
from S3 that lifts the, to the standard contact structure on S3. And in that sort of closed world, um, these things, so if, if P is not equal to uh, 4, then again, there's a unique minimal, you can put weak on here, filling. Um, and they're all, these are all, uh, these are all disk bundles over, over the sphere. And this is Dusa, uh, plus a bunch of other stuff we want to soup this up. Um, oh, and I don't remember when this is. Um, when p is equal to 4, there's actually two fillings, um, one that you get as the disk bundle, and one is that you get as the, com the complement of a, of a uh, quadrant curve in, in, in CP2. Um, but both of these, these well, so Eliashberg is sort of a relative homomorphic curve filling by disks. Um, Deuce's uh, uh, theorem comes from uh, embedding this into some closed manifold where you know that you've got some sort of, uh, you've got a symplectic sphere of positive self-intersection, and this is then going to sort of fill out the entire closed form manifold um, and give you something which is either rational or ruled. So you can get constraints on what those manifolds are by, by looking for planar things uh, planar holomorphic curves in here. So genus zero holomorphic curves that are floating around there give you constraints on what these fillings have to be. Um, the, those techniques get, can get souped up. So um, L21, which is RP3, which is the unit cotangent bundle of S2, um, uh, Deuce's uh, original theorem is up to uh, diffeomorphism, I think. Um, this gets souped up to actual symplectic morphism or up to symplectic deformation. Um, and then you can say even more, again, using these sort of planar things. Um, uh, for example, T3 with its standard contact structure, um, uh, this was classified by Wendell using some combination of, of uh, the tools from Eliashberg and McDuff. Again, you're trying to find some genus zero holomorphic curves with some constraints coming from the contact structure that are going to sort of be guaranteed to fill up your manifold. But again, this is still some sort of genus zero uh, uh, picture here. Um, okay, so why should we think about this as genus zero? The unique symplectic filling in this case is um, T2 cross D2. Um, this symplectic form, though, comes from this description as the uni unit cotangent bundle. Of, of T2, which is the unit cotangent bundle of S1 cross S1, which is, again is the, the product of the two unit cotangent bundles. So really, this is the annulus cross the annulus uh, with some product symplectic form here. And again, so this is where this is where sort of the, the, the planar comes in, right? Sort of, you know, you think of T3 as really being something that should be genus one. Um, I want to tell you, no, really, the T3 you should think about it as being genus zero. Really, there's a bunch of annuli that are floating around that are telling you what the contact uh, structure is. Um, so this this should fit into the planar world too. So that's the unique symplectic filling of T3. Um, okay, um, you can generalize this using some version of either Wendell's results or um, or or Macduff uh, to lens spaces LP Q C standard. This is Liska. Um, you can do LP one um, uh, any um, contact uh, structure on the lens space. Uh, this is uh, Olga Plamenevskaya and myself. Um, you can do some small cipher fibered spaces, not small, sorry, some cipher fibered spaces. Uh, uh, you can classify the, the, the uh, minimal um, weak symplectic fillings. And um, for the most part, the classification is, u is unique. Liska's work gives you some finite list. Um, also, uh, uh, Laura Starkston. Is it resolvable? Oh, you, you probably know how to fix it better. It's the, it's the window? I think so. 
Yeah. And someone's just really disappointed by talk so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's really creepy, yeah. Um, all right, things that so things where we actually have a classification where there's a, a unique or a finite list of things. Um, so here it's finite list. Um, this is unique. This is a finite list. Um, and then I'm going to put uh, Collodi in here as well using different techniques. So Laura's techniques are very similar to Paolo's. Uh, Collodi's techniques are similar to uh, mine and, and Olga. Um, and then you can also do, no, I'm running out of space here. Um, you can also use complex tools to get finite lists similar to, to Stark's done here. Um, and then I think Park, and I don't remember his colleagues, who was just talking about this to you. So you can use complex geometry to get a final list. But again, every, everything that's on the board right now is in some sense genus zero. You should think of these as planar things. Um, everything is coming from the fact that if I've got a, a genus zero holomorphic curve, it, it has a, a positive uh, dimensional family that it, that it lives in. So these, these sort of have to evolve and fill out the entire manifold. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, so these are all um, these are all planar. Um, all of these lists are finite. Um, yeah, those are the, sort of the big the big the big points of what's up here right now. Um, so that's where we have classification. This is a loose thing. There's no way that this is actually complete, but um, that gives you some sense of what's going on. OK. Um, um, there's also a lot of non-classification, things that tell you that, that basically you have no hope of classifying. So in some sense, most fact three manifolds have infinitely many uh, distinct, um, even Stein fillings. And the way that you produce this is by looking at the mapping class group, um, uh, picking a, an open book decomposition, and finding uh, a bunch of different factorizations of the monodromy into positive Dane twists. So somehow, this is a, there's a, a relatively minimal constraint on the monodromy. It has to be positive enough. And then you can produce infinitely many Stein fillings. So somehow, finding something that's in between these two, um, or understanding the, 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 the world in between these two, uh, is what we're trying to do. All right, and then and I guess what I want to say about this is somehow you should expect these things to have to be be high genus, although we don't really know what that means. And I mean this in terms of the minimal genus of an open book decomposition, or something about minimal genus of homomorphic curves in a in a in a filling. I'm not entirely sure what that should mean either, but um, those you should think about those as being high genus objects. Okay. Questions? All right. OK, so let's, let's look at the example that we're, we're interested in right now. So let's get, um, make this thing the unit cotangent bundle of a surface. And two of the examples are already up here, right? So when the surface is genus, uh, is, the, is the sphere, we have a classification. Um, when the surface is, is T2, we have a classification. So the, the only interesting case is when the, the genus is bigger than 1. And uh, somehow, I will not really convince you, but, but I'll sort of hint at this. Uh, you should think of these as being genus 1 objects for some weird reason. And we'll sort of build this to, to begin with right now. Um, but you can also, uh, Patrick Masso has some, some uh, things that sort of suggest you should be able to build a genus 1 open book on this uh, as well. OK. Um, all right, what's different about this? Um, 
in these cases, all of our, our classifications work for uh, minimal weak fillings. Um, so any symplectic structure, any symplectic manifold is fine. You can classify those. Uh, in this case, you can't classify um, symplectic fillings in general. And that's because um, as, a, as, a, as a disk bundle, um, maybe as any disk bundle, um, uh, McDuff shows you how to produce a, a contact structure, or a, sorry, a symplectic structure on sigma cross an annulus that has two convex boundaries <coughs> that are sort of pointing out like this. And then if you want to take any uh, symplectic form, or a symplectic form manifold over here, you could, oh, I drew this picture too tall. So here's, here's your sort of uh, sigma cross an annulus here. It's convex on the boundary. I take any symplectic form with boundary, or symplectic form manifold with boundary over here. I could add in a Weinstein one handle, and then you can sort of cap off the rest of this using Eliashberg uh, or Etnayer. And that'll produce uh, a symplectic filling of um, the, the side of this picture that I, I'm interested in. So one side of this is going to be our contact manifold over here. This will be minus y with some other contact structure. Um, you can, um, oh, I guess I, I mean this to be twisted then. Um, so I can, I can change this however I want. Whatever, thing, whatever symplectic form manifold I plug in over here, uh, I can produce some symplectic filling in my contact manifold here. And this can be, let's say, the homology can be as big as you want. You can make these things. You can get infinitely many uh, symplectic fillings this way. So you're sort of out of luck if you're just asking about symplectic. Can you get, this is even strong. So this, this sort of exact condition at the boundary is preserved throughout this. But you can classify, at least to some extent, um, exact or Stein fillings, and that's what I want to. I want to sort of go through a little bit of the details today. Um, yeah. All right. So the goal is to constrain or classify, in some sense, um, uh, exact or Stein fillings of the unit cotangent bundle. So this, is, this has a lot of other contact structures. I should sort of point this out that um, this is maybe the, the only one in its, uh, uh, with its given churn class. But, but there's, there's an infinite number of contact structures on here. And a bunch of them. A bunch of them do satisfy, or sort of you should think of it as genus zero for some reason. And a bunch of them have infinitely many Stein fillings. So somehow um, this contact structure is, 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 the, is, is the thing constraining it. It's not, it's not about the manifold itself. OK. Um, all right, what are we going to do? We're going to use um, uh, this, this idea of a Kalabi Yau cap. of Lee, Mach, and Yasui. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, it does make it not Stein, yeah. So even if you start with this thing being Stein, uh, this thing can't be Stein, I guess. Uh, and when you cap, this, this cap is often going to destroy any, any Stein. Yeah, you're going to, topologically, you're forced to have three handles even, so. OK. All right, so um, one way you can think about the procedure for producing all of these other factorizations is to find a nice concave filling that you could constrain any, any convex filling. So if I know something about um, some sort of cap here, whatever hypothetical filling I glue in here, um, this is going to give me constraints on what this total manifold is going to look like. So for example, um, 
I think almost everything on the right uses McDuff to find some sort of S2 of positive self-intersection inside of this cap, and then tries to understand the ways that this can be embedded inside of a rational or a ruled surface. Um, uh, that's supposed to be the letter Z. <coughs> All right. Um, so Lee, Mack, and Yasui talk about generalizing this to the sort of the next level in the Kadari classification. Sort of these you should think about as being Kadari dimension minus infinity. Um, we're going to sort of bump up to Kadari dimension zero and try to understand uh, what constraints we have. So we know a lot about symplectic Kadari dimension zero manifolds, and we're going to use that to give constraints on what this closed manifold is going to be whenever we glue in this hypothetical filling. Um, um, so, what, what, so what do we want? We want uh, a convex filling with um, uh, first turn class uh, trivial or torsion. <coughs> OK, so I'll talk a little bit about how to produce such a cap, and then um, We'll sort of wave our hands at what this tells you about um, uh, exact fillings. Um, when you glue an exact filling to something like this, you get something which still satisfies that uh, uh, that a, a condition that that T. J. Lee proved uh, gives you Kadari dimension or symplectic Kadari dimension zero. That'll constrain the topology of the manifold. Um, but then we're going to sort of uh, when we when we pass to Stein, we use a bunch of topology uh, of just three and four manifolds. To, to extend this to, uh, to, to a much stronger classification of Stein fillings. OK. OK, so let's, let's build a cap here. Um, so uh, the K3 surface um, is the elliptic uh, surface uh, E2 here. Um, it's, a, it's a singular torus vibration over S2. It's got 24 singular fibers. Uh, and I want to divide this up into pairs of 12, although really I don't need that many here for what's going on here. So here's S2. I've got a, I've got a T2 vibration over S2. And over each of these uh, 12 or 24 singular fibers, I've got something where my, my torus has collapsed one of the two, uh, in this picture, one of the two generators for uh, H1 of, 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 of T2 here. Um, and I think I'm going to call this guy A. And maybe I'll call the red guy B. I don't know if it's pink any different than white. And so this side is going to look like um, AB to the 12. And this side is going to look like AB to the 12. And the nice thing about this setup right here is that if you look at what the, the, the bundle is over this separating uh, circle here, it's trivial. So sitting over this, this, this gamma here is a, just a T2 cross a gamma. There's a T3 sitting there with, with sort of trivial monodromy. And using that, we're going to be able to, to construct um, uh, the, 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 this cap. Find something that we can, we can, we can cut out that's going to give us a complement, which is going to be our cap. So <clears throat> the, sort of the standard symplectic filling that we're looking at here, this, this cotangent bundle, you can think about this as a, as, a, as a uniform neighborhood of a Lagrangian surface inside of your symplectic manifold. So what I want to look for in here is a Lagrangian genus G surface. Um, that's going to have some standard neighborhood. When I remove that, the complement's going to be the cap. So um, what can we do? We can take um, G copies of, of A, each sitting over uh, um, a fiber over gamma, and I can sort of trace them out by the monodromy. That'll produce uh, Lagrangian tori, a bunch of G disjoint Lagrangian tori that are sort of all sitting above this, this, this curve here. And then you can also um, find a Lagrangian sphere that runs across that um, by just, just finding matching vanishing cycles. So if I have two copies of B on either side here and I find the sphere that's sitting between them, B is going to intersect each, one, each of those tori. And so I'll have this, this configuration of Lagrangian surfaces inside my symplectic manifold. If I resolve all of those intersections, I'll get a closed symplectic genus G surface, um, uh, which is Lagrangian. So I've got G tori, uh, which are um, some copy of A cross gamma sitting above here. I've got a sphere, which is a Lagrangian matching sphere from B2 to uh, from some, some uh, 
singular fiber with, that we've denoted b to some other singular fiber we've denoted b. And then if I take the union of these things and resolve, I've got a Lagrangian genus G surface that's sitting in here. OK. Um, that's how I get my cap then. The neighborhood of this is has a convex boundary. The complement will have concave boundary. That's going to be the, the thing that we want the cap to be. So uh, xg is k3 minus this neighborhood of the Lagrangian surface. How are we doing? Um, yeah, just in in the neighborhood. I mean, there's a yeah in the neighborhood. There's just uh, another Lagrangian that you can get by that that that's smoothly the resolution of these two. Um, can you just say sorry? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, so so you you take the, just the two vanishing cycles and you want the other cycle to be transverse or what? I, I lost. Can you say? Again? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so so we've just we've sort of picked these two A and B curves to be the, the ones that were presenting the vanishing cycles. And for right now, there's additional constraint that we're gonna we're gonna use. So I'm gonna bring this down just a second. But but right now, yeah, B intersects A at, at that just that single point. So it's gonna intersect to this sort of corresponding torus um, above wherever that arc intersects gamma in a single point for each of these these curves here. So there's these sort of G copies of A that we're seeing on the bottom left. Those will all intersect uh, at, at g distinct points in the torus that's sitting above the intersection of gamma and that arc between those two b's. And so you, you take another torus in addition, or just those? Those g tori. <coughs> so if I have g tori here and this one sphere that's in between them, and I resolve all of these, that'll give me something which is genus g. It's basically a connected sum when you do the resolution. No, no, it's just it's just tracing. Yeah, it's the it's. Well, you a, choose a section which goes through all of those. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's those like you, we could pick those exact copies of A, and you're taking the product uh, uh, torus sitting above the 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 torus vibration sitting over gamma. So it's sort of horizontal to the vibration in that way, and then any time it hits, it'll hit. If I look at the, the trace of this sphere, this vertical sphere I'm showing here, um, it sort of it's a it collapses to a point over the x on the left and the right, and then as it goes through, it's just tracing out b. So those those are your intersections there. Okay. Um, well, um, so let's we're gonna call this thing xg. Um, there's yeah, OK, so let's pull this down. So there's one, one additional fact that, that we want to point out from this. And that's that um, if, I, if I look at the complement of this collection of, of uh, the, this surface here, right? Um, oh, maybe I actually do want to diagram this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, K3 is simply connected. So I've got um, I've got my 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 unit cotangent bundle here. Uh, if I look at a sort of cipher band Kampen diagram of of E two uh, with this decomposition, I've got this mapping into X G and to the unit cotangent bundle, and these both map into uh, K three, which has trivial fundamental group. The um, this direction, um, all of the 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 generators of the fundamental group of this thing that come from the base of the surface. This is a this is an S1 bundle. So I've got sort of generators that come from the genus G surface. Those all map over here. The only thing that doesn't uh, that that doesn't survive to this term is the is the the vertical fiber, the meridian to to this 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 surface here. That's the thing I need to double. I I I see has to sort of die in this picture in order to get this this to give me something which is trivial. Um, and so I know that the, the sort of meridian to this is zero, uh, or trivial when I map it over to here, um, because uh, it's, no, what's the thing I need to double check? I'm saying something dumb here now. Um, 
all of the base curves. Oh, I need to check that. That's what it, that yeah. All of the all of the, the the generators of pi one that come from sigma, those all have to die in here. The only thing I don't know that dies is the meridian, and I'm going to show you that that dies right now. So um, so the pi one of y. Uh, Pi one of x g is generated by um, by the meridian to to sigma. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But that's already going to be zero here. Because the meridian, you can think about it as the meridian to any of these tori or the meridian to one of these spheres. And I can find a sort of dual matching sphere uh, that runs from A to A uh, along, let's say, this path here that intersects B in exactly one point. So that thing's actually dead because there's a dual sphere that intersects this exactly once. There's my claim. So pi 1 of x is, 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 is trivial. Um, Okay. Uh, the second condition that we wanted that, uh, but, well, so this is this is useful just for constraining things. Uh, the condition that we really want that c1 is going to be zero comes from the fact that 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 k3 has c1 equal to zero, and this is again you know some a junction realization the fact that it's fibered by tori, so um, so if I restrict this to to xg, I also get something which has uh, c1 equals zero. OK. Um, yeah, OK, so these are things to point out too. So what about K3? So K3 um, has B1 equals 0, has B2 equal 22, B2 plus is 3, B2 minus is 19, signature is minus 16. Um, pi 1 is 0. Um, what is it that I'm cutting out? I'm cutting out basically a neighborhood of a surface. So I'm cutting out something that has b1, but I'm only cutting out something that's got b2 equal to 1. And it's sort of deleting something that's got you know, one of these, these positive square things. So if I look at the, the corresponding information about xg, um, b1 is 0 because it's simply connected. B2 is now going to be 21 plus um, uh, 2G in this case. You're going to pick up a bunch of uh, indefinite things from the, the, the genus of, of the surface, from B1 of the, the, of the boundary. Um, B2 plus is 2, um, and the signature is now a negative 17. So B2 minus is still uh, 19, and B2 zero is 2G. Um, yeah, I want to say this because I do want to give some sense about why it is that when things die, they die the way they do. OK, so, um, so let's start with an exact filling. So y is going to be the unit cotangent bundle still. Um, I can take I can take w and I can glue it to uh, to xg now, and I can get some closed, simply connected manifold here. And um, I know that 
um, I know that what? I know that C1 now of z evaluated on my symplectic form is going to be 0. Um, and why is that? Well, so if it's exact, then down here my, my symplectic form is going to be 0. So if I sort of evaluate it, whatever my, my C1 here is on that, I'm going to get 0. Um, so this is omega, the homology class omega is 0 down here. And up here, the, the homology, or the, the C1 is 0. So between the two of them, as we pair these up, we get something which is 0 everywhere. <coughs> OK, so um, this tells us that we're a symplectic Calabi Yau manifold. So this is, this is something that TJ Lee has been sort of putting together forever. Um, what sort of constraints do you get on the topology of the manifold that come from understanding something about C1 of some symplectic form on it? So um, the rational ruled case, this is, this is basically what's telling you that McDuff's theorem that if you um, um, if you have, let's say, a sphere of positive sunflower intersection number or some, something that's going to detect that from, uh, from the perspective of the cyber witten theory or, um, I guess, from cyber witten theory, then, um, uh, oh, I lost the train of thought, sorry. That's going to give you something that's, that's like simple like your dimension minus infinity. It's the smooth version of being rational or ruled. Um, so smoothly rational or ruled. So this is a smooth invariant. You're rational or you're ruled. Um, zero means this symplectic calabi yau And what this means is that your, your, your rational homology uh, is that of a torus bundle, um, the Enrique surface, or K3. Um, if you're one, it's, I think we're still not sure what one means. But for example, things that are actually Calabi or uh, could I mention one are going to be higher uh, elliptic vibrations. These are things still that somehow should be genus one that just aren't these objects. Um, and then two is going to be your sort of general type. Um, oh, I was actually going to tell you what these were for here. Uh, but now there's no space. So let's put this in blue. So uh, this is telling you something about k dot k being negative. Uh, this is k dot k being 0 uh, and k dot omega being 0 of uh, the cohomology class. Uh, this is k dot k 0 and k dot omega positive, And this is k dot k positive and k dot omega positive. OK, so let me tell you what these things are real quick. But the point is just that we're in this situation right here. And, and so TJ is going to give us uh, strong constraints on the topology, the, the closed manifold. So OK, so um, this, is, this is what you should expect from Cyber Witten, right? If I've got, uh, um, so if I've got, I've got, um, um, I've got Talbots are just telling you that I've got a, um, that that's a basic class. I've got um, Gromov that's telling you that that's realized. And um, it's symplectic, and therefore it's symplectic. It's got to have a positive self-intersection number. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, sorry, not symplectic, a junction. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, generic. That's the statement. Um, so this is sort of this is this is this is what you should expect basically from from being cyber witten general type. Um, these are going to be things that 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 are going to be more constrained. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, wait. OK. This is all to tell you um, that um, whatever z is, it's actually going to have the same homology as k3. And so from that, you can get constraints on what the homology of, of, of W is. So the corollary from all of this is that um, the homology of Z is the homology of K3. And I can give more details, but maybe later, because we should talk about some fun things. OK, pause. Questions? How's that coming? <laughs> I made some big jumps there, so yeah. Okay, so the, the corollary from this is the following theorem. 
Um, so if uh, W is an exact symplectic filling, uh, then what? Then And um, OK, uh, this is what we came up with. Um, it turns out you can get rid of this completely if you take a bit different cap than the one that we did. And uh, Lee, Mac, and Yasui do that. So they get a sort of stronger version of this theorem here. Um, we're going to take this, in, and, and instead of thinking about this question, we're going to promote this to, uh, to, to something about Stein fillings. And I'll sort of explain how we get uh, that. Uh, that'll be sort of the rest of the talk here. Um, in fact, omega is how much W equivalent to you? Uh, well, it's how much W equivalent to a surface, but it's it's how much W equivalent rel, rel boundary to the disk cotangent bundle. So, yeah, maybe we should put uh, these are how much W equivalent. So. And we say some stronger things, but um, yeah. Unfortunately, it's not enough to we, we to deduce anything stronger because uh, we don't have um, anything like the Escobordism theorem for for this fundamental group. So this is this is as good as we get right now. Okay. Um, so this is this is uh, super Myriatoris, um, and I want to talk about this, which is some some fun group theory. I'm not going to do those. I'm not going to do those. I'm not going to do those. Good. OK. Um, fantastic. So what is it that we really need to do here? Um, no, I can't tell you that yet, because we actually have to say something. OK, so let's, let's try to understand the proof of this. So let's take pi 1 of y. So this is a circle bundle. Um, it's got a presentation uh, in terms of the, the sort of generators of the surface um, and uh, a circle fiber. And the, the relators are the, the t is central. And that if I take the, the product of all the commutators of the i's and the bi's, you get t to the 2g minus 2. Okay, so you, this is this is suggesting that, that, that sort of homologically this this looks like the the disk cotangent bundle. We want to say something about what the fundamental group looks like, and one of the conditions about being Stein is that it has a decomposition as um, uh, zero, one, and two handles. And so topologically, that's, that tells you that, that pi 1 of, of w comes as a quotient of pi 1 of y. Um, you can think about building this the other way, that um, if, I, if I cap off um, something, the meridians of the co uh in, in y, then you should get the, the quotient to, to omega. Uh, to w, sorry. So um, this means that right pi one of y surjects pi one of w, and the expectation is what what the what should happen is just t should get killed right if I if I kill t that's giving me the fundamental group of the surface that's the thing we expect to be the 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 filling coming from the the theorem here, um, so we expect the kernel to be something which is generated by by t, um, that's the goal is to show that in fact that the kernel of this map is t on the nose. Um, okay.
that let's skip that one. That's good. OK. So if we use the super version of this, um, one of the things we know is that, that t is going to die um, in homology at very least. So um, I know that, uh, you know, the homology of, of y, the homology of this group is going to be z to the 2g plus z mod uh, 2g minus 2, where that 2g minus 2 factor is generated by t. Um, this comes from the surface itself. This is going to come, you know, in our picture, conceivably from the fiber. That's got to be 0. So t has to die in homology. Um, so if I, look at, um, if I look at the induced map on homology here, uh, t is going to be sent to 0. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to shortcut things. I can't shortcut things. All right, so let's do this. All right, so claim one is that um, pi 1 of w is generated by the images of AI and BI. OK. So why would that be true? Um, so what is, the, what is the quotient of pi 1 of y by this group? So call this, call this group pi 1 of y mod h, the sort of normal subgroup uh, generated by these guys, uh, is just z mod 2g minus 2. And I've got an induced map uh, from that to pi 1 of w mod whatever the image of this, this subgroup is, the thing that's going to be generated by these things here. Um, and I guess normally is not needed here, because uh, the complementary element is, is, is central. Um, so I've got this map from here to here. Um, let's suppose that, that um, this, L, so this is pi 1 from uh, y to w surjective is going to be surjective. Um, let's suppose that that this is actually not zero, right? So that this is there's something that's, that's going to show up here. Um, well, then I've got um, uh, so if this is not this is z mod k z for some some k, it's going to divide that guy. Now I can look at the k fold cover of w given by this 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 projection, this sort of fundamental group coming from h here. I get a w tilde. Um, its boundary is also going to be something which is a, is a corresponding cover of my contact manifold. Um, but now we're going to get a contradiction because the what does this cover look like on, on y? Um, we're looking at something which is killing the, uh, sorry, we're, we're looking at something that's picking out the fiber here. So when I look at this cover on y, it's unwrapping in the fiber direction. So this is going to be some other circle bundle over, over a genus G surface. So this is going to have B1 to G again. Um, Um, but what's the what is what is w w is uh, w tilde is some some k fold cover of w so the Euler characteristic of w tilde is k times the Euler characteristic of w. Um, this is um, k times two minus two g. Um, uh, and what's the problem now? The problem is that uh, I've only got this much homology, and this is going to be too negative to give me the Euler characteristic here, right? So this is this is something that's got zero, one, and two handles in it. So the Euler characteristic is the, the, this, the is one for the sort of the zeroth homology minus the first Betty number uh, plus the second Betty number, and this thing is bounded um, by uh, this thing. So this is a this has to be bigger than or equal to one minus two g. Again, this is because of the topology. It's coming from the Stein filling. It's only zero, one, and two handles. Uh, everything that's represented here has to show up in the boundary. So there's your, there's your first contradiction. Let me pause on this real quick. So the idea is that if I take a cover, I get something where I don't see enough homology in B1 coming from the boundary, um, because I know what the cover looks like here. This is telling me that from Euler characteristic reasons that, that I would have to have too much uh, first homology. The Euler characteristic is too negative. OK. <laughs> All 
All right, so pi one of w then is generated by um, uh, these 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 things which are, which are generating like the surface uh, portion of pi one of y. Right. This is this this part is surjective. So if I were to actually just kill uh, t everywhere on this, I would get the fundamental group of the surface on the left coming from y. That's going to map on to whatever quotient of, of pi one of w. So I can take um, uh, I can take pi one of y mod the, uh, this this subgroup generated by t. This is then going to surject onto pi one of w mod the sort of image of this. Um, what's the order I want to do this in? I don't need that one yet. What do I need yet? That's it. That's good. Um, and I also have the sort of homology of this and the homology of this. And this is an isomorphism. So this is pi 1 of sigma. And now let's suppose that, that um, I've got something that's in the kernel of this. So I'm hiding things over here. Is that sort of visible? I want to say that, in fact, so I know that this map from here to here is surjective. I want to say that this map's actually injective. So let's find an element of the kernel and see if we can detect it somehow. And what is this telling us? This is telling us whatever the element in the kernel is, it has to be um, uh, 0 in homology. Because right now the is we have an isomorphism on, on homology. So let's see if we can detect uh, this, this element in the, in, the, in, uh, in the fundamental group. And what we're going to do is just basically pass to um, some finite normal cover, a finite regular cover, which is going to pick this out. So um, all right, I've got, I've got this quotient here, right? So I've got corresponding maps from pi 1 to z mod k, pi 1 of w to z mod k. Those are going to give me covers again. So I've got two covers. Uh, where do I want to draw this? OK, so this is telling me uh, the homology class of gamma is 0 in pi 1 of y mod t. All right. Um, I want to build on this, but uh, I want to do this in a way that I can actually see this picture. I don't think I can do it here. I have to move. But it's clear what we need to do. We need to find a cover um, which preserves this characterization here, but which lifts gamma to something that's non-zero in homology. OK, so I've, if I have a map that looks like this, and I, and I look at the corresponding covers, um, so I've got a corresponding y tilde that's coming from this, and I've got a corresponding uh, w tilde that's coming from this. Um, we've already killed the, the vertical fiber here. So whatever, whatever happens under this cover, this vertical fiber is going to lift to a, like k copies of vertical fibers. Um, so whatever cover I get from this is actually going to be induced from a corresponding cover of the, of the surface group itself. So this is again going to be the cotangent bundle of some cover, the corresponding cover of, uh, of sigma here. Not, not, that's actually that's equal. Those are the same objects now. So whatever I have over here is going to be some Stein filling, some Stein filling of the corresponding uh, cotangent bundle that you get from this particular cover, and that's that's where we sort of build the, the picture, right? Because now I can say uh, the same thing is going to be true um, if I pass a homology here. Um, I'm going to get the homology of this thing here, 2g prime. That's going to be an isomorphism. This object lifts to something in here. And this is going to tell us that, again, the homology class has to be 0. 
But surface groups are really nice. You can you take any any uh, homologically uh, homologically inessential curve, embedded or not, inside of a surface, and you can find some finite cyclic cover even uh, for which it's non-zero in homology. And the easiest way to say this is just to quote it as being refers, but um, but you can you can sort of see this the sort of topologically in general. So um, so for any gamma in sigma, um, there is a finite cover. Uh, so there's a well, there's a I guess there's a sequence of cyclic covers. Um, there's a there's a um, I guess there's a solvable cover. Uh, there's a sequence of cyclic covers. So that uh, uh, gamma lifts to uh, a homologically non-trivial curve. So this just needs to be uh, a, a loop. It's it's an element of pi one, or a free homotopy class of loops. Um, okay, I'm going to punchline this now because I think sort of we've lost this a while ago. But what's the point? We had whatever we whatever el the hypothetical element of uh, of the kernel of this map. Um, it has to be zero in homology. We choose the covers to be ones that are induced by, or we, we construct the covers so that they're induced by covers of the corresponding surface. Um, and therefore, we can detect uh, this particular curve in homology in some, in some, uh, some sequence of finite uh, cyclic cover, some, some abelian uh, solvable cover. Um, yes, that's the goal. OK. Um, <coughs> There's one other thing we have to say after this. So this tells us that that map has to be uh, an isomorphism. That's an isomorphism. OK. Um, we're almost there, right? Because what did we really want to say? We wanted to say that this is that these two groups are the same on the nose. The last thing we need to do is actually check that this can't happen. And the easiest way to do this is to uh, is to let Stephen do it, really. Um, but you can look at you can look at uh, the cohomology of the corresponding uh, extension here. So you're gonna this th whatever this this group is, um, I star t to pi one of w to pi one of sigma. And look at the, the linden hock shield Sayre spectral sequence corresponding to, to this extension and see that the homology is just wrong. So um, uh, this group has to be 1. Uh, uh, by homology. So look at the homology coming from the linden hock shield, hock shield Sayre spectral sequence. Either you get too much, thing, too much in B1 or you get too much in B2. Um, and either way. You get the wrong homology for the, the surface that you know. OK. Um, I'm not going to go any further, so thank you.